Okay, I would like to get started, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, Sally Manuel today. My name is Gertie, and um, I'm glad you're all here, and um, that Sally can join us today for our um, first nursing history lecture in the School of Nursing in 2015. So that makes it sound important. <laughs> yes, it is, and um, we are also pleased to acknowledge that the IP Bonner um, Center is um, helping with the recording, so that uh, for those people who cannot actually come, we still have an opportunity to uh, watch talks afterwards. And um, as an introduction to you, Sally is a graduate from UBC. She studied in the Center of Gender and Women's um, Studies, yep. and uh, worked as um, with um, Dr. Nikki strong Boer as a supervisor and work on the history of um, women and health and we'll share a piece of her um, research, radiation, um, visitation research with us on um, the history of cesarean section and um, she's recently been appointed at Douglas College and in the background there is a beautiful little baby mm -hmm. that has also come along in the process so we're very proud to have you here and we are in the Thank you very much, Girti. Hi, everybody. <coughs> I'm just getting over a cold, so I apologize for the coughs if and when they come. Um, it's that time of year, unfortunately. I guess nurses all know about that. Um, so we've all heard about discussions lately about cesarean sections. We read about them in the news, about how the rates are unnecessarily high in North America. I think the last figure I heard was 33% in British Columbia of... of uh, of childbirth are, are uh, cesarean and how r crazy high that is. Um, the generally accepted rate from what I know, and I'm certainly not a medical practitioner, is about 15% that was recommended in the late 1980s and I haven't seen any revised recommendations so presumably that's still the recommended rate so therefore we're kind of double. Um, and when I was reading about that and thinking about it, I started looking at the historical roots of this phenomenon, of this uh, astronomic rates, and when did it start rising and all those sorts of things. It's pretty easily traceable to the early 1970s. Um, the concept of preventive medicine, the increasingly litigious nature of medical practice, and a whole smattering of medical, social, cultural factors contributed to this rise between 1970 uh, and into the 1990s. Um, and what I wanted to know was what happened before that? What happened between the time when C-sections were dangerous and this time when obviously they weren't dangerous anymore because they were being practiced with reckless abandon, per se? Was there something that facilitated this phenomenon? And if so, what was it? Uh, was there something, uh, a whole number of questions that were, really got me started on this project, um, which eventually, as, as Geertje mentioned, became my doctoral dissertation. Uh, my study investigates the period of time immediately prior to this exponential rise, examining continuity and change in the practice of C-section in the key period from about 1945 to about 1970. Um, and I suggest that a new normal was being established uh, in which surgical childbirth offered promise for better birthing outcomes. Um, from the 1940s, when the, the mid-1940s, when the operation was deemed by English-Canadian specialists to be safe, in their words, for both mother and child, to the early 1970s, when concern about its possible overuse became prevalent. I looked at technical, professional, and ideological changes that encouraged increased physician and patient comfort with the operation. So today what I'm going to talk to you about is a case study that I did as part of my dissertation, uh, and and an, I'll give you an attempt to, to gloss over the general contextual element as well. Um, I'll provide an overview uh, of the overall project, and then I'll talk about the specificities of the case study, uh, and then there'll be time for questions and comments at the end. Uh, so in terms of the era that we're talking about, this is a very, very rudimentary chart, but it helps people get their mind around what we're talking about. We're looking at cesarean sections in a very specific time and place, um, and I'm trying to determine its role in how reproduction was conceived, if you will, within that era, uh, as well as to understand the period in which, or in between 
the thought of cesarean section as being risky and the thought of cesarean section as being overdone. What happened in between those two times is what I'm looking at. For reference, uh, here's the quote that sort of inspired me in a number of ways uh, from the Canadian Medical Association Journal in February of 1947. A Dr. Anderson said, in recent years due largely to improvements in technique, the safety of cesarean section has markedly increased. This has resulted in a widening of its indications so that today there are few obstetrical complications which may not, on occasion, be best dealt with by abdominal section. So that's in 1947 that this one Canadian doctor is saying, okay, C-section is safe. And that's kind of my starting point. What happened between then and 1970 when the rates started to go up? Uh, my investigation suggests a change in attitude towards surgical birth in this era, but one, not one so drastic as to increase the rates such as happened in the 1970s and 80s. Specifically, I looked at the context of St. Paul's Hospital, where operations occurred in cases when the fetus had to be removed quickly to prevent the death of either the mother or the child or both. But they also were relied upon increasingly in scenarios where the threat of death was not the primary determining factor anymore. By the end of the 1960s, relative indications for surgical birth had overtaken absolute ones in terms of why doctors were performing C-sections. Caesarean birth during this era had become an option even when existing records suggest that danger was not clear-cut. So my interpretation of the records is located in the wider context of both Vancouver and St. Paul's Hospital in the 50s and 60s and of the ideological and technological environments that I explore in more depth in the dissertation, which you can read online uh, in UBC Circle um, if you're so inclined. <laughs> It takes into account commonplace discourses about motherhood, uh, medical care, structural changes within the rapidly secularizing hospital throughout this period, while focusing on a select group of individual mothers who were having C-sections in BC's largest city after World War II. Some of the specific uh, uh, contributing factors include, uh, after World War II, Canada alongside much of the Western world, was engaged in a, product, a project of modernization, technological advance, and the creation and expansion of state-funded social programs. In the Cold War context of creating a safe nation and accompanied by a baby boom that defined the socio-political landscape of the rest of the 20th century, these factors contributed uh, to a specific trajectory in terms of medical care and parenting. Reliance on professional expertise in both Canadian and international contexts, an extended medical infrastructure, and social rhetoric emphasizing the importance of medicalized pregnancy and delivery affected the conditions under which women gave birth. Some specific contextual factors, and this is where I gloss over entire chapters in one sentence. Um, I look a lot at medicalization, the medicalization of the body, and the medicalization of pregnancy in particular. Um, women were discouraged from active participation in the construction and dissemination of the ideal medicalized birth. In the process, the opinions of medical experts took, medical experts took precedent in decision making on topics such as intervention in general and cesarean section in particular. Parturient women as patients under medical supervision were not included in the discussions of the relative necessity and utility of surgery, nor were they routinely consulted about their wishes during delivery in this time period, especially in cases of medical emergency. The norm of the period was also constructed without attention to difference among women. It always centered on white, middle-class Canadians. Uh, risk, certainly an important part of medicalization, um, in particular during the Cold War context where the containment of risk was such a, a high priority for everyone and very much a, a, a rhetorical notion that was passed around in everyday contexts. Uh, it sort of served to, to augment the issue of risk when it came to cesarean section at the time. And I also look at the discourses of mothering from the time period. Um, there was a lot of abstract enthusiasm on the part of physicians and government advocates for technological innovation, accompanied by the simultaneous silence regarding the specificities of the labor and delivery in advice literature. Um, 
my favorite quote uh, comes from this guy, Grantly Dickreed, that you, you may have heard of, uh, who said, the fact that in childbirth there is usually a woman present is not always remembered. Um, and that was sort of in, in his literature of the era trying to say we need to pay more attention to the mother's needs and the mother's holistic uh, uh, experience. Um, the ideal birth was constructed as a doctor, as doctor dominated with passive patients who submitted to the decisions of the medical establishment. All of these factors, along with technological advances and medical uh, uh, discoveries, tempered women's experiences in birthing in general and in C-section in particular. And now that I've glossed over most of my dissertation, I would like to turn to the specific context of Vancouver and uh, St. Paul's Hospital. There's a picture of Vancouver in 1955. It's kind of crazy to look at. Um, hopefully you can get the perspective. There's Stanley Park and then the North Shore Mountains. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Throughout the 1950s and the 60s, British Columbia was among the top Canadian provinces for population growth. Increasing suburbanization was associated with population growth. While the population of Vancouver expanded in numbers during this period, the city's population actually declined from 33% of the total population to 19% uh, uh, during this time period. So we're looking at population growth, but people moving out of urban centers. Um, in contrast, the population of the entire Lower Mainland, including suburbs of Vancouver and into the Fraser Valley, doubled between 1941 and 1961 and tripled by 1971. So we're looking at suburbanization. People are moving out of the inner cities and into the suburbs. Again, not a strange thing for us to be thinking about for this time period. BC's smaller towns and cities also expanded during this period, and these expanding local communities required medical facilities. Uh, the smaller sites, however, could not readily compete with large medical school-affiliated tertiary care facilities in Vancouver. As a result, we see patients coming to St. Paul's all from all around the Lower Mainland, but also from less well-served communities near and far. In fact, women from smaller centers in eastern and northern BC contributed significantly to the patient load of St. Paul's Hospital when it came to C-section in the period I'm discussing. Now, you're probably all familiar with St. Paul's Hospital, uh, but just in case there's a picture of it. Uh, St. Paul's opened its doors to patients in late November 1894, it was founded by the Catholic Sisters of Charity of Providence and administered, administrated by the sisters until the late 1960s. It served patients from all religious denominations, but it was a Catholic-administered uh, hospital. By the end of World War II, St. Paul's was the second largest hospital in Vancouver with a 500-bed capacity. And like Vancouver General, the city's other large multi-purpose institution, and Royal Columbian uh, nearby, St. Paul's expanded and modernized quite significantly during the 1950s and 1960s. Between 1950 and 1970, close to 40,000 women gave birth at St. Paul's, and over 2,200 deliveries were by C-section. The history of obstetrical care at St. Paul's offers a picture of what C-section meant in the context of a large urban hospital, which was the site for increasing numbers of Canadian births in this era. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about my sources and my methods. <laughs> I see some smiles. That's, some of you are clearly nurses who have done this before. Um, much of my analysis for this case study comes from a textual analysis of patient records generated by and for the staff of the hospital. Delivery registers, my absolute favorite thing right now is to look at delivery registers. So fascinating. Um, they were produced by delivery ward nurses and offer general statistics about birthing and the identification of representative patient charts. Extant uh, delivery registers are large ledger books. I've cut off all the identifying information of this one, but you can kind of see how it's a really big. Um, large ledger books recording details of the deliveries in a big chart. Each record contains the name, contact information of each patient and her husband, if identified, the details of her pregnancy, including the length of gestational uh, period, previous pregnancies, and then details of the birth follow. Entries like position of delivery, ruptured membranes, induction, forceps. Some fields require a simple numerical entry or check mark. Others, such as duration of labor, um, 
uh, are completed with text. And at the end of each section, there, which also, I've also cut off of here, is a comments and remarks section, which is by far the most fascinating. Um, appears at the end of the chart past all of the, the doctor's names, initialed by the nurse in charge of the case, filled out by nurses at the nursing station. I used data from these charts, in particular the fields that indicated the patient or file number for that delivery, the use of C-section and the justification of the operation to create spreadsheets that mirrored the delivery registers, including the details of each C-section delivery. These spreadsheets allowed me to create a statistical profile of surgical deliveries, as well as to select specific patient charts for further examination. Now, you guys can probably tell me this. I'm pretty sure we still use delivery registers today, although maybe they're online at this point. Um, it's too bad because the giant books are kind of fun to open up and sit down with at a, at a table, but I'll leave that to future historians. The second major source for this chapter were patient files. Each accessible file contained various forms and records, obstetrical discharge forms, consultation reports, uh, obstetrical summaries, anesthesia reports, a whole bunch of different uh, uh, pieces of paper in each chart depending on what happened. Often uh, social service records would be in these charts as well. Some charts had only two or three pieces of paper, others were three or four inches thick. It just depended on the patient, as I'm sure you all know. Um, as well as changes in the system of identification of files, the types of information recorded and the method of completing the forms and reports evolved between 1952 and 1970. This is a period during which records became standardized at St. Paul's and probably elsewhere. Um, and so, in fact, I have another whole talk to give on the standardization of forms and how that affected uh, uh, childbirth. I'm not going to go there today. The creation and maintenance of uniform records as a requirement of professional standards of practice were clearly major tasks uh, and were ongoing during this period. Records from the early 50s are often inconsistent. Uh, you'll find completely different things from one chart to the next. But by the late 60s, each record is filled out quite a bit more precisely with comparable types of information. By identifying C-sections documented by the birth registry, I was able to select what we call an extreme case sample of 41 specific charts. Uh, knowing that I was limited in the number of charts that I could access, I elected to access the records of patients who had particularly unusual experiences or for whom the reason for C-section was not indicated. That was kind of how I pared it down given the cost and time constraints involved. So that's how I did it. Let's talk about what I found. C-section mothers at St. Paul's, like others across the province, gave birth mostly between the ages of 20 and 40. Not very shocking. Perhaps the most obvious demographic factor visible in the delivery registers is the post-war popularity of the new East Vancouver area neighborhoods. Interesting to see the phenomenon of suburbanization through delivery registers. Um, many parents tended to live closer to the city at the time of their first child's birth, but then their addresses entered for subsequent births indicate suburban locations. That's no different today. My first baby was born in downtown Vancouver and my second baby was born in Port Moody. It, it's pretty normal. But still cool to see in this different kind of document. Uh, population growth and the trend to consolidation of municipal services are also reflected in delivery registers and even in the C-section rate at St. Paul's. Women arrived from many locations throughout the province for high-risk deliveries. Women most often came from areas like Squamish, uh, northern Vancouver Island, northern British Columbia, and smaller numbers came in from the Sunshine Coast and the Caribou. Uh, seven women each came, uh, so yeah, seven women even came to St. Paul's from the United States and one from Mexico. Fascinating. I only got one of those charts though. The majority of out-of-towners out of came to St. Paul's for repeat C-sections. The indications for these uh, uh, traveling uh, uh, deliveries were mostly for repeat C-sections, some of which were more complicated than others. Other reasons given for strangers to the Lower Mainland are rarely distinguishable from those uh, of women who lived closer to St. Paul's. By far the top indicator for C-section throughout this period was, and indeed for half of the second half of the 20th century in Canada, was repeat cesarean. Uh, the reasons were rarely given in any of the uh, charts or delivery registers. 
making it difficult to ascertain how often it was an absolute or relative indicator. Um, with the exception of the final two years of my study, uh, repeat C-section supplied the primary justification at St. Paul's for performing the operation. Not surprising in this era when it was believed that once you had given birth by C-section, you had to have all of your subsequent births by C-section. Uh, repeat sections before 1967 were almost double those performed for dystocia. Um, in 1968, I think I have a slide for this. Yes, sorry. Uh, in 1968 and 1969, though, dystocia edges above uh, repeat C-section by a very small margin, which you can see uh, in this figure here. In the last three years of the decade, the difference is minimal, which is kind of interesting. Dystocia and repeat C-section becoming uh, uh, similar in numbers. Other frequent indications for C-section in this era include placenta previa, breech position. Less common were placental abruption, which is generally less common anyway. Um, other placental deficiencies, fetal distress, uh, an elderly primate, uh, toxemia, I can list them all, contraction ring, diabetes, preeclampsia, cord prolapse, and uterine fibroids. That is the exhaustive list of reasons they gave for a C-section. Careful analysis of the delivery registers and, and select patient charts reveals a gradual increase in the C-section rate during this period. This rising rate is explained by the diagnoses of labor difficulties offered by physicians. The indications given for a cesarean at St. Paul's shift during this time in favor of relative rather than absolute indicators for surgical delivery. Um, does everybody know what I mean by relative and absolute? Should I explain that? Okay, um, good, then we'll move on. At St. Paul's, uh, the stated reasoning for the operations performed there from 1952 to 1970 demonstrate a transition from C-section as a last resort operation in situations of life or death to an option in the prevention of such situations ever arising. That's really the main difference that we see. In the 1940s and before that, people were having C-sections in matters of life and death. By the end of this period, they're able to use C-sections to prevent those situations from ever even showing up. So let's talk about absolute indicators, which is to say those situations of life and death. Between 1952 and 1970, the absolute indicators at St. Paul's were steady. Mostly the rates stayed the same. Comparative analysis shows that incidents of cord prolapse, toxemia, placenta previa, and various other placental problems stayed more or less constant throughout the time period. In fact, we even see a small decrease in C-sections done for these reasons, perhaps because physicians found new ways uh, to combat these difficulties during the period. Other absolute indicators, unfortunately, didn't occur with enough frequency to warrant a statistical analysis. Things like um, severe coexistent medical disease, active her herpes lesions, um, things like that. They were occasional, but not enough to, to be able to study. They did occur. Uh, for example, one patient underwent a section at 37 weeks because she suffered from leukemia and had low platelets. Um, <coughs> another woman with cervical cancer was flown in from the central coast for a repeat C-section in conjunction with a hysterectomy. Um, another woman underwent five C-sections at St. Paul's uh, between September 1958 and July 1963 because she was quadriplegic as a result of polio. Um, there were no explicit diagnoses noted in relation to sexually transmitted infections. One woman was given a C-section in September of 1962 because of an unidentified infection uh, in the chart that could have been transferred to the infant. Although very few uh, diagnoses of a contracted pelvis were noted, one woman was brought into St. Paul's from Prince Rupert in December 68 to undergo her third C-section due to what they termed extreme disproportion. Her chart notes that she was 4 foot 11 inches tall and her baby was almost 8 pounds. Uh, the duration of her first labor had been excessive. The fetus was unable to get out. So lots of details, not always enough uh, uh, occurrences to warrant a statistical analysis. So absolute indicators at St. Paul's remained much the same throughout the period. Women underwent C-sections for placenta previa, other placental problems, cord prolapse, and toxemia.
at more or less the same rate, showing that with the exception of placenta previa, which as I mentioned went down a tiny bit, the necessity of C-section in these instances was really unaffected by technological or ideological change. Relative indicators, on the other hand, were greatly affected. As I mentioned, or I, as I should mention, relative indicators are those for which the decision to operate is not a clear-cut matter of life and death. Rather, they appear in situations where the operation could solve a potential problem before it arises. After World War II, attributing C-sections to relative indicators increased. In particular, the diagnoses of dystocia and breach positioning gradually rose at St. Paul's between 52, 1952 and 1970. This trend shows to me that physicians were becoming increasingly comfortable with a wider range of diagnoses for uh, an operation. Repeat C-sections nonetheless remained more or less constant throughout the period as well. The validity uh, of vaginal births after cesarean sections is of course now acknowledged. Um, in the decade immediately following World War II, the medical consensus remained uh, that subsequent births, births had to be done by C-section. Occasional studies questioned whether vaginal birth was possible, but such studies were rare and really never translated into clinical practice at this time. Uh, throughout the files that I consulted, only one, as far as I could tell, vaginal birth after cesarean section uh, took place. It was in July of 1965, a woman from North Burnaby gave birth for the fifth time. Her first baby was born vaginally in 1956, after which she had a second by C-section, Babies three and four were born vaginally, and baby number five was born by C-section. I would love to know more about this woman, um, but that's all the information I had about her. Um, why? Why do these things happen? Where? I mean, you could, I could learn so much. Uh, notably, not all babies were born at St. Paul's, not all the babies born at St. Paul's, as this woman was a recent immigrant to Canada. So we don't know where she had her first five, or her first four babies, which certainly would have played into what that situation was. There were no other cases of VBACs uh, noted in the delivery registers, which, as I say, suggests that once a cesarean, always a cesarean remained uh, the, the dictum of the era. Repeat cesarean often is considered a relative indicator in the 21st century. It tended more towards the absolute at this time. Uh, dystocia was the next most popular uh, indication referring to difficult or prolonged labor with a number of different complications uh, uh, feeding into that, caused most commonly by inadequate uterine contractions or otherwise difficult vaginal delivery. Diagnoses were most commonly related to the norms developed by Emanuel Friedman uh, with his Friedman curve uh, for labor. At St. Paul's, diagnoses of dystocia rose significantly from under 25%. I feel like I should have a slide for this. Yeah from under 25% in 1952 to between 35 and 40% in 1970. Women were not likely to be suffering to at all the same degree from the malnutrition that was caused by cephalopelvic disproportion in the 19th century, uh, which, which would play into this as well, uh, nor was there any significant rise in maternal age, which has also been associated with uh, dystocia. A more likely explanation is that cesarean sec when cesarean se section could be performed without obvious threat to mother or fetus, practitioners and patients alike found it an acceptable solution in instances of difficult uh, labor and or delivery. Fetal distress was the next most common, usually signaled by changes in the fetal heart rate and or the presence of meconium in, in ruptured membranes, suggests that the fetus may not be receiving enough oxygen through the placenta. The minimal rise in this diagnosis at St. Paul's in the post-war years seems related to the introduction of electronic fetal monitoring as a common practice in the late 1960s. The presence of fetal monitoring in combination with the prescribed standards outside of which a fetus would not have been allowed to stray uh, led to quicker and more diagnoses of distress even when the heart rate may only have strayed outside of prescribed norms by a small margin or a brief period. So really, it's increased understanding of fetal distress that likely caused more diagnoses of fetal distress. Um, and the ability to, to do that diagnosis with electronic fetal monitoring. <coughs> breach delivery is the last one on my list. Um, breach, diagnoses of breach positioning accounted for just under 2% of C-sections in 1952 and rose to over 8% in 1970, due in part to the availability of C-section, 
but also to improve diagnostic capacity afforded by uh, new technologies of the era, which is one of the things I glossed over, but I have a whole chapter on it. Um, so that's the slide I wanted. Perhaps the ultimate indication to me that doctors and parents were more comfortable with the operation during this time period is the appearance of C-sections performed in scenarios where prior to the safety of the operation, they might not have been considered at all. Two particular stories show a new facet of C-section that emerged with its presumed safety in this period, and that's what I call the psychological context. When the operation was no longer risky, the health of the woman could be considered in a broader context. Physician and nurse comments in patient, patient charts show that sometimes non-medical factors were beginning to play a part in a diagnosis of surgical delivery. For example, in October of 1959, a woman delivered a live baby boy after four previous pregnancies had ended in tragic circumstances. Uh, over a period of six years before this, she had lost four babies due to miscarriage or stillbirth. Finally, in 1959, she was admitted to hospital in mid-September with a diagnosis of threatened premature labor. And five weeks later, she underwent a C-section after a consultant recommended, and this is a quotation, elective cesarean section due to a socially important baby. While the consultant observed in her post-operative notes that the placenta was not sufficiently nourishing, nourishing the baby, at the time of delivery, there was no documented medical diagnosis offered for the delivery. The acceptability of an emotional or psychological basis for C-section seems to me evident in this type of reporting. Absolutely, there was a medical reason for it, but they didn't know what it was until after they got the baby out. The mother was fortunate to deliver a second live baby another, uh, a year later, also premature and also by cesarean section. Like her brother, this baby was delivered early because the pregnancy was threatened by health complications. My second example of surgical delivery performed in this broader health context involved a girl who was sexually assaulted, either by a traveling salesman or her step-grandfather, depending on how you interpret uh, the, the notes. Um, according to the social service records included in the patient file, an own, unknown male hit the girl while she was playing, uh, dragged her into the woodshed, and impregnated her in the West End, which is sort of an interesting thing to think about a woodshed in the West End, um, as a little aside. Uh, social workers and the family doctor, in contrast, believed that the step-grandfather with, with whom she lived was the putative father of the, the baby. The grandparents had hoped to keep the young girl and her baby, but both mother and child were eventually apprehended by social services and placed in foster care. The baby boy was born in late April of 1958, and the reason given for the cesarean section was 11-year-old primate psychological reasons. Now, I can't imagine an 11-year-old girl giving birth. There's clearly a medical reason for a C-section there, but that's not what they wrote down. They wrote down psychological reasons, which I think is fascinating. Um, a more detailed description of the operation notes that Rather than put this young girl through a long labor, which might end up in C-section anyway, to save her the psychiatric shock of a long labor, and because the baby was large, it was decided to do a C-section. Like the earlier case, while physiological reasons certainly existed for this operation, the documentation of its existence stressed emotional and psychological reasons as the primary diagnosis. These two cases, to me, are exemplary of the broadened indications of C-sections uh, in the post-World War II era of surgical safety, if we can call it that. Both mothers found themselves in extraordinary health circumstances, which were able to find resolution in the promise of this no longer life-threatening operation. Moreover, the documented reasons for these operations emphasized emotional and mental health rather than physiology. While only two of the 41 extreme cases that I analyzed showed such unique circumstances, it is nonetheless significant that they existed uh, practitioners were able to minimize the risk, rendering childbirth overall safer for women and showing that relative indicators could be valid choices for surgical delivery. Such decisions demonstrated the increased comfort with which practitioners approached the operation after World War II. So the overall result of this study is that, oh, I have a slide for that. C-sections were more useful in this era, not just in matters of life and death, 
but also in less obvious cases. At St. Paul's, the C-section rate rose from 4.5% in 1952 to just under 10% in 1970. This rise in rates was mirrored across the country, where overall rates rose from roughly 2% to 8%. It reflects the newfound safety of the operation and the consequent broadening of indications for its use, enabled and accompanied by developing technologies and techniques, increasing professionalization of obstetrics, and an ideology around mother, motherhood that suggested medicalization was the best option. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I made it. Yeah. And that gives us some uh, time and opportunity for questions. Uh, and, and also thank you for bringing the to so the medical context and the social and historical context together. I think it's a pretty important thing. I think even, even in medical practice now, we're considering uh, uh, the, whole, the whole element of the patient, where they're coming from, what their environment is. And I think if we look at these phenomena in larger social contexts as well as clinical contexts, it, it really expands our understanding of what was going on, for sure. That was so interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, this takes you away from your dissertation per se, but quite clearly you're interested and involved in this topic. So if you look forward from there and you then add in culture where this data is, as you point out, pretty white and middle class, and the whole issue of cesarean to to my mind, with, with my limited knowledge in this area, um, what we see now is this, this sort of schism where on the one hand you've got cultural aspects which are pressing for an ever-increasing rate of yes. deception. On the other hand, I mean, the latest Health Risk and Society Journal is full of articles about the dangers of any kind of medical intervention with birth. And um, the whole rethinking about risk and issues, uh, about staying out of hospital, only working with midwives, even midwives are problematic. It's a very interesting set of articles if you haven't seen them. I haven't, no. Um, it's the Health Risk and Society Journal. Uh, the most recent one, I think, 2014 anyway. Yeah. Um, so, what? can you sort of speculate a little bit about how we got from there to now? Oh. And, and some of the reasons why, I, I suppose I partly suggested, you know, the, the rise of multicultural society and my, my knowledge of having spent time in Hong Kong and in China yeah, yeah. to see different approaches to C-sections. Um, is it a bigger issue then, the medicalization, which was really, med medicalization and technology was clearly important, very important yes. in this yes. era. Um, I think what you're asking me is to link this time period to now. Yes, well, um, some specul specul Very hard to do because the critical period in between, the 1970s and 1980s, where we see the rates, quite literally, if you look at the graph, just go just like that, and then it levels off in the late 80s but keeps going up gradually. Um, there's a whole litany of things that happened during that time period which didn't happen here. Here we're looking at... Physicians getting comfortable with C-section and parents recognizing that they're not going to die if they have a C-section. And, and what, what came from that and how did it function? In the 1970s, once that had all been established, once it was safe, once people realized how we could do it, you see so many more arguments. Litigation, of course, being a huge argument. Um, even like from thalidomide on, you, you, there's a whole change in the way people think about medical practice. But you also see in the 70s, um, technological ultrasound revolutionized how, how we deal with pregnancy. Um, we see the women's movement, the women's health movement in the 70s. Absolutely changing the way mothers think about childbirth. So there's a whole, it, it becomes very complicated um, when we see women starting to question why these decisions are being made without their input, the problem becomes increasingly more problematic. Um, discourse, hegemony, Foucault, etc. <laughs> um, I can tell you 
that to me, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. Well, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a I'm not a practitioner of these things. I was a doula for a while, but really that was just all touchy feely, nice babies. Um, it it to me the biggest problem now is agency, and who has agency and who doesn't. So many women don't know about midwives. So many women just because it's what their moms did. You go to the hospital and they do what they need to do to get the baby out of you. They don't know that, that they can advocate for themselves, that they have choices, that they can have a home birth or a hospital birth or a midwife or a GP or an obstetrician or you know, uh, an induction or a not induction. I don't think women know. And I think to me that is the most critical factor. And I think when you're talking about intersection, I think white middle class women might know. But a lot of them don't. Other women in Canada have an even harder time accessing that information, knowing that the information exists. That's, to me, the agency and, and, and the, the cultural factors play into why more women are having C-sections, because they don't know that they have other options. So you're sort of suggesting that the power of medicalization remains because of the educative process which would be required. Yeah, there's something that... Yeah, can, I, can I ask a question sure. in relation? Yeah. Because I, I was curious about that too, that, that whether the notion of power also links with um, how uh, risk is perceived. Because right. now um, it seems like it has flipped. That it was just in the newspaper around Brazil how many yes. um, uh, C-sections are done because of the schedule of the practitioners. Yeah, it's the same in China. Yeah, and so then I was um, curious as to um, that that the schedule, that the fact that the schedule of the practitioners has become dominant, has then changed the perception of um, the threat of risk, because that then the the domination maybe that's related to agency in your, your case, but that that the, the shift is now that. People get upset around, or, or women, I don't know, around the, the medical dominization, and that then they feel um, that there is no no attention to um, the sort of impact of it on on the bodies. But women are scheduling too, aren't they? Yes. Well, so telling doctors. Mm -hmm. they, not so much. Not really. In because the media, much, the media oh, will lead you to believe themselves. that women are scheduling C-sections, but in fact it's about 1% of the population who are scheduling C-sections for uh, uh, logistical reasons. Um, they've done it, the Center for Rural Health Research here in Vancouver has done studies about uh, uh, the two posh to push phenomenon, and it, it really doesn't exist. It, there's a few people who have been notable in the media who have done that for their schedule, it's not a common phenomenon. Uh, but you do find women, uh, uh, like, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about even a friend of mine who's very afraid. She's, she's I, I would say, uh, she has a psychological problem, that she's afraid of giving birth. And the concept of being able to schedule a C-section opens up the idea of having children at all to her. So there are some people like that, but I don't think they are at all even close to being a majority. But the media wants us... And that's the media in that article about Brazil, which I read as well. I think the media oversimplified it to the point where it just seems like all the doctors in Brazil want to go play golf. And that, I think that is also oversimplifying it, although clearly it's a problem. I think the C-section rate in Brazil is like 75% or something. I just spent three weeks in Brazil and toured five units in totally different parts. And the um, maternity units are back to pre-1950s. A straight OR table is where they're expecting these women to deliver. So a 30% cesarean rate is not at all surprising. They also have a huge shortage of physicians and midwives. They've just imported 100,000 from Costa Rica or something. I mean, just absolutely ridiculous as far as the... I do think that's another factor in, in childbirth now, and I mean, this is not at all then, is that the lack of, of practitioners. There are not enough midwives anywhere in Canada at all, not even close. North America. We have trouble finding 
uh, people to be general practitioners. I mean, we've, we've all seen that phenomenon. And obstetricians are even, uh, I read an article about people not wanting to be obstetricians because of the malpractice insurance. Uh, they'd rather be a dermatologist or something. Plus, the hours are kind of crappy. Um, and, and I agree on that part. So <laughs> what, what, what pregnant and laboring women have access to and how they have access to it is part of it, but who's going to help them out is, is another part. And I mean, all the midwives I've ever met are, are so happy to help as many women as they can, but they only have so much time. Midwife burnout. I, I predict in about 15 years we're going to see a lot of articles about midwife burnout. <laughs> or maybe earlier, I'm not sure. So tons and tons of factors that are different now, and I'm not a sociologist, I'm a historian, uh, so, so I'm, this is certainly not my professional opinion, it's my personal opinion, but um, I do think there's a whole smattering of practitioner, patient, culture, medicine, all of those things all move in together, but I do think if women had more agency, we would be able to do more about it. And I think if the government funded mid midwifery, we'd be able to do a lot more about it. Sally, I had one question about this time period as you were analyzing, and you made, and thank you, this was phenomenal to hear in a nutshell what I'm sure is just years of work. Um, the maternal and infant mortality rates, because you, you very eloquently described that difference between absolute life-threatening risk, which is where we originated with C-sections, to this more, I'm sorry, to the more relative um, situations. Did you did you look at that, and did you see any differences in maternal and infant mortality? I did. I, I, it's not foremost in my brain yeah. due to the oxytocin. Um, but uh, if I remember correctly, I'm not very excited about this being recorded, but <laughs> if I remember correctly, maternal mortality went down, infant mortality went down less. Um, and I attributed that in my technology chapter, I think, to incubators, not reliable incubators uh, until well into the 70s. So you could get the baby out, but you couldn't necessarily keep it alive. Um, and that, that was a technological disparity. In my technology chapter, there's a lot of discussion of disparities in the types of technology. We could do one thing, but not the other thing, and so it, you couldn't really end up doing the one thing anyway. Um, and, you and that was part have of it. Had any of the technology to be measuring um, the status of the fetus, to no. be holding off on the C-section if no. they were jumping in earlier, or not yeah. really knowing. Electronic fetal monitoring started happening in the late '60s. Ultrasound existed, but was not in use at St. Paul's until the '70s. Um, so not a lot of ways to monitor the fetus other than, than uh, with the, the thingy yeah. that you put in. <laughs> you know, the thingy <laughs> that you listen to the belly with. Thank you. Any other questions here? Uh, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. And, uh, um, and I, I do think that it is very complex. You know, we seem to jump onto one thing about, oh, the reason why cesarean section rate is going up so much now is because women are demanding it, and then they've done studies to say, actually, no, they're not, and you pointed that out. It's, it's well documented. There's or huge... there's something else going on. Obesity yeah. is going up. That's a reason for more C-sections. Maternal age is going up. It's another reason for more C-sections now. Not, I didn't see any evidence of that in this period, though they didn't record the weight of the women, so I wasn't able to factor in obesity. Um, but nowadays, I would argue, I mean, those are two main factors that you don't read a lot about in the news. You read about doctor's golf games and women requesting it. You don't read about uh, uh, maternal age and obesity being important elements. Just high risk associated with the obesity. With the yeah. increased maternal age, we have increased risk factors yeah. and comorbidities. Women who never had babies before, yeah. having them now, heart, congenital heart, and all that type of thing. But I would also like to see the correlations between um, um, fertility, help, and and type of delivery. I don't know if there is one, but I would be interested to see uh, um, fertility, IVF, IUI, whatever and delivery and breastfeeding. How, how do all of those things interrelate? Thank you Cheers for uh, exposing us to a fascinating kind of development. Thank you for inviting me. This is yeah. such, such a wonderful thing to be able to do while I'm on maternity leave and I'm mired in diapers and oxytocin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>